Hello, Monetization Nation. I've got a fun episode for you today. Sam Malikarjanan decided he wanted to work for HubSpot. So he did something super creative and got a call from a HubSpot recruiter within just three hours and 26 minutes. He was hired and became the head of growth at HubSpot Labs. In today's episode, Sam will tell you his strategy and how we can better market ourselves. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business, causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan William, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. I'm excited today to be joined by Sam Malikarjunan, who's the CEO and founder of OneScreen.ai. Uh, that is an IoT or Internet of Things enabled ad marketplace for the physical world. Sam is the former chief revenue officer of Flock.com and the former head of growth at HubSpot Labs. Sam taught advanced digital marketing, innovation management, and strategic economics at Harvard University, super impressive, and is the faculty chair for the digital marketing department at the University of South Florida. Sam is also co-author of the book, How to Sell Better Than Amazon, which ironically is for sale on Amazon and was ironically the number one bestseller in its category on Amazon. So congratulations on the success of your book, um, your success in your career, and thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Can you start off by sharing with us something that you're super passionate about? So I have hobbies, right? Like I, um, you know, horseback riding, I spent three weeks in Mongolia, et cetera. My, my wife jokes that my my life's ambition is to be small business Batman. Um, <laughs> like the people who have the most interesting problems are the people who generally can't afford to hire consultants. Um, so people early in their career, like I wouldn't be where I am today without people helping with that. And then just like, you know, your favorite small businesses. So I, I, I'm really passionate about how do we create a world in which small businesses are a viable economic model 20, 30, 100 years from now, um, given the fact that everything currently is favoring larger and larger companies, more and more consolidation? Uh, let's move on to having you share with us your journey of becoming an inbound commerce expert and uh, your, your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, so originally I was an, an AM FM talk radio host in Tampa. Uh, we had a, a weekend talk radio show about cigars and I sort of just, everybody in the cigar industry is, they haven't changed the way they do business in a couple hundred years. And so they, they saw me and they're like, Hey, you know how the internet works, right? And I'm like, yes, you know, I know how the internet works. Uh, and they all asked me to build their websites. And so they asked me, and so I would build their websites for them, uh, but then they didn't make any money off of their websites. And they're like, how do we make money off of websites? I'm like, I don't know. This is not like my <laughs> shtick. Uh, and so I started Googling things like, you know, how do you do internet marketing, et cetera. And um, I, I came across this company called HubSpot. And HubSpot um, had lots of great educational content. Uh, on like how to set up Twitter. It was, it was very basic back then. Remember, like nobody knew anything about anything. Yep. Um, we still had to convince business owners that ranking on search engines was a worthwhile business goal before we taught them SEO. Now, obviously, like, you know, people know that. Um, and so I, I downloaded their content. I learned from them uh, and then ended up, I decided I wanted to work there, but I don't actually have a college degree myself. I, I have no bachelor's degree. Uh, I dropped out of USF where, Ironically, I was later a faculty chair. Uh, and so I built a website uh, called HireMeHubspot.com. And I got the free credits you get when you sign up for Google, LinkedIn, Facebook ads. Uh, mm -hmm. And I ran ads targeting people who worked at HubSpot to sign up for the free webinar on why you should hire me. Um, ironically, so it's the best campaign I ever ran. Three hours and 26 minutes later, I got a call from their recruiter. Um, which is good because they had, they had not done a webinar on how to do webinars. So I was really bluffing. Uh, if like they hadn't reached out to me before then, there was not going to be a webinar on why you should hire me. Um, but then, yeah, so a few months later, I, I moved up to Boston. And that's really where I began, you know, the bulk of my career um, in marketing. And I, I wasn't at a disadvantage because I didn't have a strong background in digital marketing, but no one did. 
back That's then. right. And colleges so we're weren't kind of teaching that. Yeah. College. Yeah. You, you couldn't have had a degree that taught you how to do that because it wasn't available. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. And then where'd you go? And what were you focusing on there at HubSpot? So at HubSpot, I built our e-commerce unit, uh, which is when we wrote the book, End on Commerce. Our goal was to figure out how can, because HubSpot is not an enterprise company primarily. It sells to mid-market and smaller businesses. Uh, and so in true HubSpot fashion, setting the bar low, they said, how do we design a methodology and then a software that lets you know, e-commerce companies beat companies like Amazon? Or is the entire future just Amazon slowly rolling up every category into itself? Um, so I, I, I ran the e-commerce team uh, to begin with. Then I briefly ran our, uh, the marketing for our expansion to Latin America. In true startup style, in no way qualified to do so, but somebody had to do it. Um, and then we got really good traction in Latin America. And so we hired somebody who knew what they were doing. Uh, and then after that, I uh, was the head of growth for HubSpot Labs, which is an interesting thing to think about if you are an interesting business. Companies like HubSpot have teams designed to figure out how to kill themselves. Uh, so if you were a nerd in a basement at MIT, how would you disrupt HubSpot? How would you hurt HubSpot? Um, and then let's and do it first before someone else can do it to us. Design an experiment to validate whether or not that'll work. Uh, and then like feed that. It's a, it's a sad job to have, by the way, because if you ever succeed at anything, it gets taken away and given to a core team. Um, but yeah, I did, I was at HubSpot for about eight years and, uh, then went to Flock, was there, uh, until COVID hit and I had to lay off a bunch of people, including myself, um, and then accidentally launched a startup last March. And tell us about Flock really quick. What, what does Flock do? So a lot of the concepts we take as fundamental are, are things that really need to be challenged. So I, I, I refer to the 20th century as sort of like the Lean Six Sigma century, which is all about efficiency. Lean Six Sigma is how do you remove waste and repetition from a process, make it really efficient. Yep. Um, but innovation sort of by definition is inefficient. And innovation is not an option anymore. And it's not like a side thing that you do. It has to be core to the business. Um, and back in the day at HubSpot, I had built this thing called Help a HubSpotter Out, where you could fill out like a form and with whatever problem you were having that day at work, it would go out to people who had also filled out a form that said, these are the skills that I have. And whoever was available would click a button and, you know, you'd, you'd get some help. Uh, and when I went to Flock, one of the one of the core things that needs to that we need to find a better solution for is the org chart. Right. Like org charts are very efficient They're the it's a repeatable process. Uh, you don't want a lot of innovation happening. You don't want like the random, you know, uh, intern one year out of college to just be able to control the entire website. But with that process, you can't you can't be fast. You can't leverage all of the skills that are inside your team. It's like you may specialize in monetization, but you also know a weird amount about honey because uh, we talked about that before we started the interview today. Yep. Um, and as a manager, I've always been paying for that skills for that knowledge i've just never been able to access it before and so the concept behind flock was you know slack sort of brought uh and hip chat sort of brought, brought instant messaging within an organization back to the forefront uh which was which was good in some ways uh better than email but then just hop on google sometime and search for how slack is destroying my life at work and you'll find like 500 articles um it was that's only like chat is only part of the solution. And so the concept behind flock and the suite of tools that they are still building over there and they have, they have a great application is like, can you make a team that can actually communicate and function efficiently? You have, you know, the, the ability to get the help that you need to get the information that you need um, to be really, really efficient without it just being becoming like a new source of stress uh, where I have 14 Slack messages that have come in since we started talking. Okay. So, so you worked at Flock. It's employee collaboration, helps facilitate, especially remote work teams. And, uh, and you've now started a new startup. Yeah. Tell us about your new startup. So the new startup we launched in March. Um, 
again, it was just a hackathon. We built this little thing. You, you plug into a TV if you're a business owner and it turns it into basically has the same power as a cell phone. So it can run like a real time content network with real time ad auction um, and you can make money off of it. So that was the concept. Uh, then we did what we half jokingly called a reverse stealth mode. So a lot of startups go in stealth mode. They don't want anybody to know what they're building. Uh, we called all of the large companies in this industry, which is called the out of home advertising industry, which is when you see ads and you're not at home. Uh, we called all of them and told them exactly what we were doing. And I had never in, I think in my entire career, I've run two billboard campaigns. So billboards are an example of out of home ads. Uh, it's not something I had thought much about, but they, it's a really archaic industry. So like 94%, I think, of the ads, you have to pick up the phone and call somebody if you want to buy them. Super fragmented. So I just finished this analysis. Like there's 16,000-ish billboards in the state of Florida. Uh, there are 812 different companies that own them. There's no like directory of all of those companies. Um, and because of this, 50% of the inventory goes unsold every month. And so as we saw that, we set out to say, okay, can we... We take the lessons of the internet with, you know, using machine learning to optimize towards campaign objectives for marketers, using an auction to make sure inventory never goes unsold, but also like Bloomberg wants to blow half a billion dollars in three months. Uh, none of that really went to, to this industry. None of it goes to small businesses or to the, the companies that own billboards or whatever, um, because there's no auction. Um, and then can we make it so that it is like smart and privacy, privacy centric? Um, and so can we take like, the things that were good about the internet, it sounds weird to start with ads, but ads are the obvious way to make money when you have like a large network of screens. Um, but can we take the things that made the internet good and replicate that same experience in the real world, helping small businesses um, and uh, as people who can make money and then also helping small businesses because it's how they get, how they get customers, right? Small businesses are by, by definition local. And so they're never gonna, if you hop on Google, your, or Facebook ads, you're coming up against Amazon in whatever bid you're doing if you're selling something or you're coming up against a larger company. When you're doing local, hyper-local marketing, the number of people who are competing with you for that audience is way smaller. And so the odds that you can have cost-effective marketing that brings customers to you if you have access to that and, and it can be done effectively are a lot higher. Uh, so sort of bringing the full circle, like I'm passionate about helping small businesses. It's not usually the case that the thing that makes me money is the thing that I'm, I get to be passionate about, but that's what we're building is a, a marketplace that connects, you know, people who, who own ad inventory, which could be a screen in a bar or restaurant could be a, you know, a sign at a bus stop or it could be a billboard on the highway with uh, the brands who, uh, who value them the most. And then making that, that transaction, that campaign smart. Wow. And there's so many of those things, the movie screens at movie theaters, right? So many different things that don't fit into that Google ad network and don't have a marketplace. That's a billion dollar idea. Congratulations. The internet marketing used to be easy. Here's the thing. Like back in 2006, I got a cigar website to rank for the term health insurance just because I was bored. Uh, it's been ruined because 20 years of nerds like me have over-optimized it. So you have like, you know, Costs on Facebook, on Google, on LinkedIn, everything is so high now. It's so competitive, um, and yeah, obviously we we think it's a, we think it's a unicorn billion dollar idea if we can make it work. I mean, it's a thirty one billion dollar global industry where half the inventory goes unsold every month. Even if we do a bad job, we should still be able to make it like fifteen billion dollars, right? Yeah. Um, but our bigger question is like, how can we how can we take it even further, and how can we make like we're all tired of staring at screens, man. We've been doing it for a year, staring at our phones, staring at our laptops. How can we make it so that we can have that same functionality, whether it's app, ads or apps that people can build on our network um, and like have the, what makes the internet smart and useful, but not be stuck in this room all day. Love it. Okay, what's the biggest home run you've hit in your career? Ignoring the Hire Me HubSpot campaign. That was, <laughs> that was, that was a pretty good one. Yeah. Um, the biggest home run that I've hit in my career would be would be the e-commerce team at HubSpot. It's what what led to writing that book. Um, it was 
it, it was difficult to figure out like how to make that methodology work. It was difficult. There's, there's math behind it too. The economics, like e-commerce companies aren't usually selling something that's super expensive. Like a B2B company is when you're doing internet marketing. Um, and also e-commerce marketers were hard to market to. They, they, we're, in 2011, when we were doing this, e-commerce marketers had had a pretty long run uh, for the last like 10, 15 years, and they thought they were really smart and already knew all the tricks. And their their businesses would grow just because e-commerce itself was a good idea, and it was still a novel enough idea. Um, and what we had to do was not only invent the methodology and then work with our product team to invent the software to make that methodology work, but then how do you how do you get people who where things are actually going quite well even if you're not doing a great job how do you get them to adopt something new um it's my my joke with my team is it's, it's easy to be a saint in heaven right like when everything's going well it's easy to be innovative when everything's going poorly and you have no options it's easy to be innovative it's that sort of weird middle ground um and we did a really good job of just like educating educating the market and then especially we did a good job of of not thinking we were the ones who had all the answers and like some of the best campaigns they did not come from my team they came from customers uh and they came from letting them tell tell the story and figure out what we should build and what we should be selling uh etc so that's probably my biggest win became uh an integrated part of hubspot later uh, it was no longer what we called an, an internal experiment and then um you know, now obviously HubSpot has a, a ton of e-commerce companies, but more so than that, I think it was, this is more of a B2B thing, but I think it was back in like 2015, search volume for inbound marketing past search volume for cold calling. Um, and those, those really annoying spammy tactics that made the internet a terrible place to be because of people like me getting CR websites for the term health insurance. Those like those spammy things that we used to do back in the day uh, have died and people have blogs that educate you. They have live chat to help you answer questions. They have, you know, all the things that, that make an experience online and good uh, businesses have those. I'm, we're not, I'm not taking all the credit for that, but um, you know, we, uh, we, we did our part in making the internet a less miserable place for e-commerce. Love it. And on your LinkedIn profile, you have some, some really cool uh, metrics that illustrate or help quantify some of these successes you've had. Um, you have, you have some metrics there under, um, let's see, the objective was to create and dominate new market, a new market for existing products. Um, do you want to share some of the metrics under that? Or do you want me to share some of them? The, the um, first of all, wow. You have done more research than anyone else who I've <laughs> interviewed with in like the last 10 years. Um, that was probably referring to the e-commerce space, right? Mm -hmm. For that particular one. Yeah. Um, creating, creating a new market is interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm having this problem now because the, the, the people already in the industry, I was doing a demo with one large company who will remain nameless. We were 20 minutes in before they realized that API did not stand for the American press Institute. <laughs> wonderful people, wonderful people. Spoken at their events. I've spoken at three of their events, by the way. Yeah. Uh, but like, you know, this industry, is, the current industry is not technical. And then the digital industry, they're like, you know, billboards or TVs and, and, and whatever, like, what, what are you talking about? They don't, they don't understand that. They just understand like click and test two yeah. phrases against each other and optimize the click. Yep. Um, and so whenever you're trying to, to create a category, it's, it's, it's really, really hard. Uh, some of the metrics can be subjective things like search volume uh, and that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, HubSpot, the reason it became the $20 billion something company it is, is because we were incredibly disciplined around the unit economics. So I measured like how much money we spent on marketing, how many leads we generated. Uh, I had a small sales team because it was a subset of HubSpot. I only had four sales reps. So lead scoring isn't useful. So I just had them rate the leads high, medium, and low and told them whatever you rate low, I'm going to get less of. Whatever you rate high, I'm going to get more of. Um, and then it was a question of can I get, can I get, accelerate the number of customers we get every month and reduce the amount that it costs to get each one of those customers. Uh, I tracked and obsessed about every metric in that funnel uh, and just, you know, optimize it over time. And that's, uh, 
that's I don't know. I actually don't know the metrics you're looking at on my LinkedIn profile because I haven't updated it in a while, but I presume that's what they're referring to. Yeah, what I pulled into my notes here was um, your key result was a 22 times increase in incoming leads, a five times reduction in customer churn, and a 200 times increase in monthly recurring revenue. Does that sound right? Yeah, that's a good stat. Yeah, yeah um, really impressive stats. There's another one under your global expansion objective. Um, if you want to talk about that a little bit, and, and with that one, you had 15 times increase in lead flow and a 58 times increase in monthly recurring revenue. So I'm going to tell you an embarrassing story, uh, but I don't work there anymore, so I don't care. Okay. And I don't know how, how many how many of the folks in the audience are familiar with HubSpot, but if you Google them, it's a marketing sales and marketing software company. Um, back in the day, we had an international marketing team which was designed for marketing outside of the United States. It was probably like over a year before we realized that people overseas don't call themselves international marketers. They call us international marketers, right? So the, uh, you know, it was, it was very, just a very like, you know, American centric uh, mindset that we had. We, none of us had led global expansion before. It was, you know, a young tech startup company. Um, but then we opened, you know, our office in Dublin uh, to lead the expansion into Europe. Uh, we opened the uh, the office in um, in Australia, uh, and then led into into Asia Pacific. Uh, and then we needed somebody to lead the marketing for to test expanding into Latin America. So we generally would like to validate experimental ideas, just like with um, e-commerce. We wanted to figure out as quickly as possible if this was a good idea before we invested a bunch in it. Um, and man, that was just the, uh, the competitors in the industry, just not paying attention to their blind sides. Yep. Uh, none of them had done that localization of marketing, having it in, in Portuguese for Brazil instead of Spanish, right. Having, uh, you know, the, the local dialects of Spanish using statistics that are relevant to those local markets. So there's different digital video and social media behaviors in Latin America compared to the United States. Uh, we just got really good at hyper localizing. Um, I, I I hired a, a Nicaraguan college student off of Fiverr to just speak to me in Spanish 30 minutes a day. Not that that was useful, but I didn't get good at it. But like it was important to me to try and understand, um, you know, the people that we're talking to, because so many marketers think that it's talking about yourself and what makes you great. Um, and I used to joke when I had the cigar show that I, I like smoking cigars when I'm doing calls because if it goes out it means i'm talking too much i'm not listening enough um with the exception of interviews i guess um but uh we just got really really good at listening and understanding the challenges and just i mean it became i think hubspot's third best international segment uh really really quickly um and meanwhile microsoft salesforce marketo the other people who were hubspot's nominal competitors uh, we just we just blew past them i think we got to a hundred thousand blog subscribers in like four months for the marketing blog, um, mm. just because we we took the time to listen and we took the time to really understand what people's problems were and how they were different than what we wanted to say. And then we did that. Thank you so much, Sam, for sharing your stories and knowledge with us today. Here's some of my key takeaways from this episode. Number one, when someone buys our product or service, they're also buying us. We need to become a personal brand and learn how to market ourselves. Number two, customers are more likely to make a purchase when a brand provides a personal experience. Number three, before we can start to market ourselves, we need to know who our target audience is. Number four, if we wanna share messages that resonate with our audience, we need to know what they care about. Number five, we need to show our personality. What makes us different from everyone else? We need to provide a unique selling point. And number six, we can build trust with our audience by being reliant and admitting when we are wrong or don't know something. If you enjoyed this interview and want to learn more about Sam or connect with him, you can find him on his LinkedIn page or visit his website, onescreen.ai, and you can find both of those links on the blog post for this episode. Do you want to be a better digital monetizer? Then please follow these channels to receive free digital monetization content. Number one, you can get a free monetization assessment of your business or subscribe to the free monetization e-magazine at monetizationnation.com. Number two, you can subscribe to the Monetization Nation podcast or YouTube channel. 
And number three, you can follow Monetization Nation on Instagram and Twitter. How do you market yourself? Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I wish you success in your monetization journey. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it. 